Our next speaker is Michael Griffin. And he is going to speak today about Afghanistan, its role in the regional picture. And Michael Griffin is author of Leaping the Whirlwind, the Taliban movement in Afghanistan, published in 2001 and a revised edition published two years later. He currently comments on development in Afghanistan for BBC, Al Jazeera, Sky, and Radio Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've uh, been a little bit assiduous in writing this down, so I hope you'll uh, ignore it or ignore the implicit insult of being lectured. Since July this year, when Britain and the US launched Operation Panther's Claw and Operation Dagger's Thrust in a bid to clear Helmand province of the Taliban in time for the elections, the media in this country, and to a lesser extent in the US, has been at pains to portray the conflict in Afghanistan as a hopelessly botched and misguided operation. Every soldier's death, every mother's tears, every slip of the tongue by every dissident general and sergeant has been marshaled by the largely pro-conservative or anti-war press to the club with which to beat the government of Gordon Brown, although it was a previous administration that so gaily marched its men to the top of the hill uh, three and a half years in the real war that began in Helmand in July 2006. The lack of helicopters, flak jackets, sniffer dogs and, dogs and basic weaponry have all been portrayed in the press as Brown's fault, as if the Prime Minister not the Ministry of Defence were in some way responsible for the time and supply of material to the armed forces. And the guy, under the guise of supporting our brave boys, the media have been waging an eminently successful pre-election campaign that has seen British support for the mission in Afghanistan fall from something over 51% one month ago to around 30% last week, as if it were the nature of war to, for it to be determined by interactive website slots on the BBC or The Guardian or a straw poll of a thousand citizens. Wars were not intended to be fought like this, nor armies to be generaled by soldiers' mothers. I mention this because I find it a very strange experience to be asked on BBC World about the state of play in Afghanistan at the recent election, and to realize that the Taliban's commanders, strategists, advisors, and even foot soldiers are, if they speak English, probably listening in. Hugely gifted in the art of propaganda since their resurgence in 2003, the Taliban know precisely what you and I, the MOD and the field generals, are thinking, almost as if they were being updated on the UK's war morale by Twitter every 10 minutes or so, which in effect is, is what has happened. They have learned to play at war through deadly displays of inspired planning, events such as the Afghan police who took the lives of five British soldiers, or the suicide bombing of the Interior Ministry in Kabul, are more than a blow against the oppressor. They send messages of intricate and corrosive subtlety. Those two incidents, for example, say, you can't trust the cops. They're working both sides against the middle, and your boys are in the middle. No effective exit <coughs> actually can be created by training police forces. Or say the suicide bombing on the UN guest house after the elections, which killed half a dozen election support workers, in addition to announcing the Taliban's dismissal of the election results, the attacker said, we can get you whenever the timing suits us. And the UN withdrew 600 of its staff to Dubai. Or the capture in the run-up to the Pakistani offensive against its own Taliban movement in South Waziristan of the army headquarters in Rawal Bindi, a city that even more than Islamabad is the real power center of the country. Ten gunmen dressed in army uniforms took over the command and control block of the Pakistan nuclear arsenal and held it for 22 hours, resulting in 23 deaths. Their message was sublime and it was subliminal. It said, not only can we take power from Pakistan's ultimate security institution, the military, but we have sympathizers in the very nexus of power. According to Seymour Hirsch, a journalist with the New Yorker and, some of the best, and with some of the best contacts in Washington, the Taliban overrunning Islamabad is not the only or even greatest concern. The principal fear is mutiny that extremists might stage a coup, take control of some nuclear assets, or even divert a warhead. It is this dimension, therefore, that I would like to focus on in the few minutes I have remaining. It has taken a very, very long time, it seems to me, to acknowledge the role the Pakistan Army and Pakistan Intelligence Services play in the success of the Taliban movement in the 1990s and continue to play in the survival and success 
out of fear that Afghanistan might one day become an Indian puppet. It was only in April 2009, following the departure of both George Bush and Pavez Musharraf, the general in charge of Pakistan, um, that Pakistan's government took the decision or was pushed into it of abandoning its policy of appeasing the Pakistan Taliban in Swat and Baljul Tribal Trust areas, and instead to try to take them head on. That policy is now extended to South Waziristan, and whenever that campaign is considered concluded, we'll move on to North Waziristan the home of the Haqqani network, the most accomplished of three Taliban segments, and of course what remains of Al-Qaeda. As British, we think of the Afghan conflict as being centered on Helmand province, because that's where most of our soldiers fight and die. The Canadians are similarly Kandahar-focused, and the French look to the Tagab, or the Tajab Valley on the road to Jalalabad, and consider that the main target. The Dutch, possibly because they're Dutch, look at the province of Uruzgan, but instead see Sebrinissa and an opportunity to wipe away the stain of that massacre on the nation's honor. By contrast, the Americans, since President Obama came to power, see AFPAC, a regional conflict with tendrils that have violently penetrated not just Swat and Peshawar, and even now encroach on Pakistan's most populous province of Punjab, but from there across the frontier to Mumbai, India, home to around 140 million Muslims. Whenever an IED detonates in Helman province, its echo is heard in India. Some time back, I interviewed an economic counselor of Pakistani birth at the EU office in Islamabad. He told me that his view, which was modern, Muslim, rooted in the past, but with eyes firmly fixed on his family's future, that I should call him on his private line in 2011, when he believed that Pakistan would finally be ruled by the Taliban. This was a European Union economic council. He said, they will be knocking on the gates of India with what seemed like an obscure pride in his own imminent demise. According to the State Bank of Pakistan, the country has a 30 million strong middle class in 2005, a figure confirmed by the Standard Chartered Bank, which estimated the number of upper and middle class at 6.8 million people in 2002, due to grow to 17 million people by 2010. In my view, the main reason why we're in, Pakistan, in Afghanistan is to prevent the collapse of the state of Pakistan, the seizure of its nuclear arsenal by a rogue religious organization, and the scattering of millions of middle-class Pakistanis to new abodes and new lives not yet built in the US, UK, Canada, France, Germany, and anywhere else their relatives have put down roots. Those who can afford to have already left their homes in the suburbs of Peshawar, so close to the tribal areas that it looks as it will soon be engulfed by the Mesud tribe. According to the Institute of Conflict Management, 6,700 Pakistanis died from terrorism incidents last year compared to 190 in 2003, an indication of the expon exponential growth of violence in northern Pakistan, even when compared to Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.